Yeah, we're live. It's been so long. We are live. We think the song played. We don't Mike know for sure. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't say that. Uh, welcome everybody to the Alpha Alpha Podcast, presented by Zbiotics. We are Eric Johansson, Armand Asadi, mm, Stephen Cesaro, and Nick Urbani. We have quorum. We have quorum. We have quorum. Oh, Everybody's yes. in attendance. Feels good. Feels right when that's the case. Yeah. Um, What's up, Chad? When's the last time the four of us hung out outside of the podcast? Wait, we're supposed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> we did. We did. We hang and out I'm not after blaming the pod. You. We hang out after the pod. <laughs> it's been a while. We hang out after the it's pod. Been a while. You guys have too much going on with your lives. The only non-work thing I can do is show up to this podcast. So Let's be honest, is your lately. life in complete tatters outside of your Yeah, startup? yeah, there is no... <laughs> the wheel of life is is flat. It's, All right. it's well, out of balance. We're going to get back on track. We're going to get back. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What do we got on the docket here today, boys? First off, is the stream functioning? It seems <laughs> yeah. to be functioning, actually, on the first try. Do we have any of our classic... Uh, frame rate? Glitches. <laughs> yeah. The well, one frame per I, second. I am 90% sure voice. that I fixed... The video glitch. We've got all the frames. I think calcium gasped because it just works <laughs> smoothly. Oh, yeah. is in that the what chat. the gasp is? <laughs> Exposure yeah. levels too high, Armand and Eric. Oh. We need something. We need one problem. So Armand and <laughs> yes. Eric. Give us uh, one. The oh. exposure? It's your foreheads. Uh, yeah, oh. see, this is what I was talking about. Look, look, I was not it's a, a trade-off. You know, we, were, we were trying. Um, all right, what's up to the chat? Dan, no, Tunsky, Calcium, z -ray? Go for nice Zerk. Cameron. What's going on? Thanks for uh joining us today. Appreciate you guys having the chat. Um, Stephen, you were feeding us a you called it a sauv. I'm not uh as much of a wine connoisseur. You're feeding us a Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, okay. yes, by, by Justin. It's quite good, actually. It's tasty, it's quite good. I, I'm usually a snob about my uh, I, I usually yeah, like I the, the old world sauvs, you know, maybe that might balance it. You're looking at me like, no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Sorry. Um, and then Armand came in hot with some, uh, what are we drinking here? You tell me, because I literally just grabbed it off the shelf. It's a Mezcal. Wow. Yep. Lots okay. of calls. Into it. it was Love recommended it. by the desk man. Okay. The desk man, the, the cashier? Yes, the cashier. It is 1509, or meal, so I actually don't know how to say it's this a in Spanish. Maguey? <laughs> no, I was trying to read the number oh. in Spanish, but oh. the thousand is... Cien? No. Cien mil. We're not going to do this right now. Right? One El mil? Principio del fin. This is bad. We should not try to. All right, we're drinking mess. The now. first yeah. omen of Montezuma. <laughs> Excellent. What go. do you guys think? I don't know. We're gonna, I'm going to ramp up it. with you after like this <laughs> little feeler here of this wine. Yeah, it's 1509 mezcal. Like it. I'm, ready, I'm happy to get there soon. All right. Um, I remembered this week yes. to take my Z Biotics. Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, let's Teed give it up a for shout you. Shout out. I like it. Thank yeah. you. You guys always leave me hanging. It's nice of you. Um, <laughs> alpha or zbiotics.com slash alfalfa is the URL. Check it out. Um, I had some Z Biotics during Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. made it a nice, easy flowing uh, Thanksgiving. No, uh, no terrible mornings. Yeah, with a bunch of family around. So. Did you get anyone new to try it by chance? No, like uh, a lot of the family doesn't really drink, so okay. it's like occasional one or two. Just solo beer. drinking. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. like that. You guys know the drill. Pick some up for uh, Christmas. Awesome yeah. stocking stuffer. Awesome like little gift to give. Be a get a single bottle, stuff. a three pack, a twelve pack if you're feeling. Yeah, generous. Jordan, if you drop a spam a link in the in the chat and it's in the a Discord. Stocking stuffer. And uh, yeah, money back guarantee. If it doesn't work for you, try it out. It's worked for the four of us. So we hope it works for you guys too and some friends and family around the holidays. Use code alfalfa at checkout. Spread the, the coupon code to get 15% uh, mm -hmm. off for your friends and family. And we're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right. Uh, what do we have? One, one more item. Actually, no, we have multiple items of housekeeping. Yeah. We have the, uh, we have the, the giveaway, right? Is that yes. today? Ooh. Oh. I don't, we need to do that next week. Oh, next okay. week. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> next deal. week, join us for the giveaway. <laughs> we'll give everyone um, a little more time to get in there. Yeah, we were so a little late uh, is... deploying the NFT. Yes, we are. We're giving away a 12-pack? 12-pack. 12-pack Z-Biotics to anyone who has, well, 
It's a, a drawing, not not to everyone who's purchased an NFT, but to 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 qualify for the drawing, purchase an NFT at uh, pods.media backslash alfalfa. Uh, we're going to start putting these live the day of the show now. We're a nice oh, cool. streamlined operation. That's right. We're getting a uh, well, well-oiled machine over here. Uh, first off, a uh, quick shout out to our number one collector last week, lemoncake.eth. Coming in hot. Lemon cake. Sh- coming surging in hot. to the leaderboard. Lemon, a number one spot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lemon Cake. Okay, so you go to this pods.media forward slash alfalfa, which, by the way, Jordan, can we add that to the website, the link tree, and the and the YouTube description? Yeah, that's a good idea. Because um, you can just go to alfalfapod.com. Well, it's already on forget. there. Is it? Yeah, the okay, Zbiotics link. Yeah. No, 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 no the NFTs. NFTs right? Oh, the NFT yeah, link. The NFTs. The NFTs. And, um, and so you purchase one of these, doesn't matter which episode, and then you enter. Yep, and Is then it, we'll... Are we doing one entry per... Oh, that's a good question. We didn't clarify yes, that. Yes, clarify the rules here. Let's make Nick's life even more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. Okay. One entry per purchase. All right, purchase. we can do that. All right, done. Yeah. One entry per purchase. Excellent. Now, winner announced next week. And it's pod. like a hundred something dollar value, right? Yeah. NZ Biotics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. And we dropped the price of the weekly NFTs as well. So you can collect more of them now, not break the bank. Yeah. Point zero it's like, zero. It's like one shekel, five right? ETH. I don't know. Yeah, it's like a shuckle. It's basically it's basically free in, in ETH land. It's the equivalent yeah. of like finding a nickel in the couch, right? But y- mm-hmm. Yes, in, 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 in ETH terms. It's, exactly. it's dust. It's dust. It's, it's dust. dust. That's what we call it. Nice. All right. Um, should we talk about our our old man legend that passed? Yeah. Just was jump there right any other it? housekeeping? Just jump right you said there was a couple more. I think that was all of it. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. all of it. All right. Let's talk about Mr. Munger. All right. Bam, and, jump in. You teeing us off? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I was curious, Eric, like uh, you're a big Warren Buffett yeah. fan. So uh, I probably, we haven't probably propped uh, Eric up enough, but like you've kind of followed Warren Buffett since we were in college together. And uh, out of everyone that I know, we all like picking stocks and investing in the stock market. But I think Eric is the only one who actually reads the 10Ks, reads the analysts, you know, reads or listens to the earnings calls or reads the readouts. He's been doing that since we were in college. Like, he's been doing that since he was much younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's been doing it younger. But I remember you like, yo, Six, I read this 10K. <laughs> I have a photo with my dad uh, reading the Wall Street Journal. I'm in his lap. I'm like a little <laughs> bean. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've been doing that for a very long time. It's very like, uh, I don't know, core to your investment style. I, I think you probably wouldn't invest in a company without reading through all of that. No, that's not true anymore. Uh, <laughs> I like to YOLO it's with the been bustle. hanging out with me too long. <laughs> All right, we're rubbing but, off on you. But yeah, I think this this moment, I wasn't prepared for. You know, like I, I don't know what you could possibly do to be prepared. He's ninety nine years old, but like this hit me. This hit me hard. This Jeez. hit me hard, and like I think, you know, it makes me think that you know Warren is not too far behind either. You know, like yeah, Warren's probably what ninety two, ninety three, somewhere around there. He's a bit younger, but yeah. like, is this going to be like a Walmart greeter situation when like uh? When your your reason for being is is taken away, then you Wait, just for, for those in the audience who might not know who Charlie is. Yeah, yeah. So um, Charlie uh, was Warren Buffett's co-pilot. You know, for the last like fifteen years or so, as uh, vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, and I think he's most notable for kind of changing the tra- trajectory of uh, Warren Buffett's and Berkshire Hathaway's net worth. And Warren gave a quote. Um, he said that the advice that Charlie gave him that changed the trajectory of Berkshire Hathaway was forget uh, what you know about buying fair businesses at a wonderful price and instead buy wonderful businesses at a fair price. So Whoa. if you've read, um, so good, there's the a book called Snowball. It's Warren Buffett's uh, biography. I've, I've read m- most of it, you know, kind of skip chapters here and there. But early on in his career, th- this guy was buying businesses based upon their like liquidation value and just trying to find a price that was less than liquidation value. And he didn't necessarily care if this business was going to be around 10 years from now, five years from now. Because he's just trying to buy something at a discount, flip it for its its real like intrinsic. hardcore value investor. Like yeah, but I I, I like take that to um to like mean all of us, right? Like we'll we'll do like trading, you know, and we're trying to like scalp these little trades or you know, we're trying to identify prices where we can like just get a, a little bit of a gain here. And it's like Charlie's advice was like, stop worrying about that, dude. Just buy the best investments in the world and hold them forever. Yeah. So forget that framework of what's the liquidation value, book value, and is your price less than that to buying 
you know, a wonderful business at a fair price. It's not less than the book value. It's not going to be if it's a good business. So if you look back, I think in the track record, like American Express, Coca-Cola, Costco, even Apple towards, towards I, the end. I think their best investment of all time in terms of dollars was Apple. And this is like completely against like sort of Warren Buffett's investment style throughout his majority of his life. Yeah, and I've, I've heard people say that, you know, if Warren Buffett would have stayed on his own without Charlie Munger's change in trajectory, he would be kind of like in the, in the dustbin of value investors, like, like most value investors. Like what epic value investors do you hear of these days? You don't hear about any of them. Right. And these are the two guys that were kind of left. But maybe without that little tweak in the business model, um, you know, Berkshire Hathaway may not have been there. So, so I, don't know, I think that's the most important thing to kind so of I'm, I'm intro curious, Charlie Before on. we get into the weeds of like his uh, principles, if you will, and like, you know, things that we've we've learned from him, I'm curious from you, Eric, like sounds like hearing that Charlie Munger passed away affected you to some degree. And you've been looking up to him and Warren Buffett for quite some time. Can you explain why and what like he represented like how it feels yeah Yeah, not just how it feels but like because you didn't know him personally obviously but no you know i think that sometimes when certain people pass that we don't know it's because it represents something yeah what did that represent for you so they're yeah both of them are like real heroes of mine and um you know i I did get a chance to meet warren once Mm -hmm. when we were in college um it was part of SDSU's like investment group, and we went to Omaha, and it was during their um, their annual meeting. And I remember that picture. Yeah, Warren yeah. pushed all of you guys out of the way, grabbed <laughs> the, t- the two girls there in the group. Two girls in our investment group, and he just grabbed both, put his arm around both. <laughs> Smart. And, and then I got uh, one step away from uh. from Warren. <laughs> but yeah, like these two guys are heroes of mine, and I I like built my entire investment framework around what they were preaching. You know, particularly like in their younger days, because they were. They were acolytes of uh, Ben Graham, who was like this mm. cigar butt value investor. <laughs> and I became sort of like that guy myself. And then I've, I've seen like my own evolution as well, just based off of how they're, you know, teaching us still. And I think what's most interesting about these guys is what they didn't invest in. I mean, they could have changed from value investing to like investing in fucking semiconductors in the what, 90s or 2000s. They didn't get caught up in the dot-com hype, even though everyone is just crushing their returns. Um, you know, they did miss out on Google, Amazon, but they didn't necessarily change their, <laughs> their investment approach. So I don't know if it's because of their you know, stubbornness or just discipline, what are you chalk it up to? But I think they're most notable for stuff they didn't even try to get yeah, in play with. Yeah, I think we'll get into his like his like philosophies and frameworks in, in a second. But um, for me, like, so the last time that a, a true hero for me passed away was Kobe. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. like this, yeah. this felt similar where it's just like, oh man, like it's, it's like, I didn't know him, but he feels like an uncle in a way. And it's I have like, a hypothesis. It's, it's kind of like, when you're a kid pl- growing up playing soccer and your hero is Ronaldo or Messi and you embody them and you don't just look up to them, but you want to walk like them. You want to be like Mike, you know, your basketball player. You want to be like Mike. And so I feel like what they represent is like your entire future self and everything that you like. They're your education. They're the embodiment of who you want to become. And I think that's why it's so hard for me. It'd be like the equivalent of like losing your your soccer hero if you became a professional soccer player. And as a as an investor, when you have an investor hero, it's kind of the same thing. It's just the hero and the and the thing that you want to embody and become in your own realm. That's true. But I'm also over, overwhelmed um, by how he left. Like he was like mm. completely lucid. He even yeah, did. The, he even two did the ago. acquired podcast two weeks ago, crazy. where he was like dropping knowledge still. And I I think that is part of like my admiration. It's like, that's sort of the way I want to be at 99. I want to be 99 and still just thriving. Well, yeah. fire up those Coca-Colas and, and peanut butter from C's Candy and you too. <laughs> did you have the health to of that? Charlie Munger? Yeah, I did. Yeah, And for people that don't know, he was on this podcast, which is amazing. We've been listening to lately called Acquired. They're and, so good. Um, it was like two weeks ago that Charlie Munger was on there. 
apparently like for over an hour, right? <laughs> yeah, and they're talking about like business deals and investing. Yeah. Like they're not like babying him. Like, right. This wasn't like a five minute CNN interview. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. What um, did, what did he die of? Just natural causes? They said he did, died you know? peacefully in his sleep. Ugh. So it could wow. be a number of things, but man. I was, I mean, I was really shook up by it, honestly. Like when he told me, I, I found out at our meeting because I wasn't paying attention. Mm. And I was like, what? What? Ch Charlie died? And then like today when I was kind of going through some of his old stuff and like refreshing my brain, like I got like really, ah, like I, I don't know. I felt really weird. Um, I felt super sad about him in a way that I haven't felt about most other people who've, who've died, I think. And Charlie is obviously an insane investor, but I've always loved him for his life wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got the best it's little like, quips on just like how to be. And he's so funny. <laughs> he's so funny. He's like super funny. Like if, if nobody's seen Charlie Munger, just just go on YouTube and just YouTube Charlie Munger funniest moments or something. He they all it just like hours of clips from him and these at the uh, you know the 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 famous the famous meeting where he's just up on stage and he's he's just he's just dropping he's like dunking on people <laughs> he's dunking but he's also just like dropping wisdom he's like roasting a, he's just yeah. roasting left and right and it's it's so good it 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 it's amazing and I I think it's it's yeah it's a shame like the the world has one he had some less, good uh, like, Elon Musk roasts going on <laughs> yeah, one liners he, he did he did drop Elon's name <laughs> in a in a sort of pejorative. Wait, what did he say I so some guy asked a question like. You know, you've often said that uh, as, as an employee or partner, you want um, someone whose IQ is 130, but uh, they think it's 120. And if you hire the guy whose IQ is uh, 130, but he thinks it's 150, it'll ruin your life and your business potentially. And he goes, oh, you must be talking about Elon Musk. <laughs> and the whole the whole meeting, just like thousands of people oh, start shit. erupting. <laughs> yeah, so he wasn't afraid to... to, to you know, launch the punches and be direct. Oh my God. I mean, Steven, you have a very different investing style than, than Eric. Like, do you, did you ever like, as you were starting to get investing, did you follow Charlie Munger? Did you ever borrow from his style? Like you're a, you're a day trader at some, some parts of yeah. your investment style, which is very different. So I don't know. Do you, do you borrow anything from him? Like take some of the tools and put them in your tool belt? I mean, I started off as like a, value person but when i was doing value investing i was like 12 so i didn't know what i was doing but i like thought i liked the idea of it and then i i got away from it because that just wasn't exactly my personality um and and yeah like i but i but i was inspired by warren and and charlie for sure but like like i said to this day like i just love charlie for his quotes and like one of his one of his quotes that i've always had stick with me like forever is um i'm gonna paraphrase it because it's probably not exactly correct but he's like you show me show me the incentives i'll show you the outcomes oh, that one that is, is and that to big. me is just like one of the best like fundamental blueprints for life i think it of it as like everywhere a, it's like a it's just a mental model it's a really good simple it's a way to model. figure out like let's say you get dropped in a business or an industry or a framework something you know nothing about but if you can figure out the incentives, you can quickly figure out, okay, this these are the levers to pull in this situation. Yeah, it's, it's, I was going to bring up the same thing. It's kind of like 100% hit rate. It's, it's, it's one of the greatest quotes for that uh, field of life. Like when you really want to understand motives and you understand outcomes, like couldn't be better. And also, yeah. wasn't he um, maybe a combination of the money and the life part? He was a pretty big proponent of like behavioral finance. Like he he talked about how humans have these biases and he did whole speeches i think you can look one up to harvard where it was like an hour hour and a half speech he does and he just talks about um human misjudgments and it was how basically like uh cialdini's influence book yeah like huh. uh and he, loss and, aversion yeah. sunk costs and he because his whole thing was like you don't have to be the smartest guy just don't be an idiot and live a long time and you're gonna get you're gonna be insanely successful he, he kind of hmm. thought that so the world his was whole thing was like let me teach you how to not be an idiot. And it was like uh, all the behavioral biases. Hmm. Have you like gone through any of his kind of life quips and anything like that in detail? Because I feel like you like a lot of the 
Yeah, the like, stuff he says. <clears throat> I mean, I love a lot of them. Yeah. Can we can we maybe talk about him because uh, in regards to like the die with zero framework we've talked about? Ooh, I like this take because um, he did have a quote that that uh, I'm just gonna paraphrase, but I within the die with zero framework he said something to the effect of like, if you're just the best at investing, if you are just the best at like taking these like esoteric pieces of paper and making more money with it or uh, you know, like getting more savvy with wealth, that's not a full life. Is that is that the quote? Yeah, yeah, he talks about that. Um, but then a- part of it is also that was his whole life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I found some like kind of like things he subscribed to and then contradictions too. Um, one of the cool things, the life ones, he talked about how you should kind of invert things. Mm. So when you look at your life, literally write your obituary and then work backwards from there and try to try to live it to the fullest. Is that I've also had a, that on my to-do list for years. Isn't and that I a framework that you guys found in uh, Tony as well? Like it, I don't know if Tony does that. Tony didn't do that? But a lot of like personal development people will sort of push this idea of like, you know, write, write your... You can, do you think you could get there to do that? Like, uh, yeah, I'm sure I could, but I don't. I I have not sat down to do it. I feel like I need to go on like a retreat and like be in a cabin, right? And like and get like, in the right for mind the next space hour. We do like, this. Really, this yeah. is all I'm gonna do, and like, like really sit and think about. It. It's not something like I want to have on my to do list and try to do amongst like other very heady work. It's a very introspective process. Yeah. Um, but when you begin with the end in mind, and you have thought through. Uh, how you want to be seen and how you want to be remembered, it removes, it's a filter. It's like any other filter in life. It's a filter in business. Like when we have filters in business, it's the same thing. It's just a filter so that you can uh, optimize toward the experiences and, and make the decisions necessary to live a fuller life. Because so many of us are on autopilot all the time and we're doing things for other people and we have no idea that we're doing them until we sit down and do something as extreme as write our own obituary. And so I think it's just like a revealing exercise. It's actually something Dan Martell pushed me to do, and he did, and he talked about it when he came by our Techstars class. He was like, that's what I... Someone asked him a business question, and he was like, well, I wrote my you know obituary, so that's how I make my decisions. It was like, what? <laughs> that's not the answer I expected to, also, to like, like as you, how to go to market. As you get closer to your financial freedom goals, you know, maybe you haven't hit them yet, and maybe the goalposts always move, but like... You know, if you're our age and you're late 30s, you're like, okay, so like, let's say I assume I hit them in the next five, 10 years or a few years or whatever it is. You know, we, I've, I've always had like a little narrow focus of like, I need to accomplish these first. And so I was thinking, well, what else do I, I mean, obviously family, kids, but uh, maybe the obituary exercise is what really pulls the juices out of like, you know, yeah. big, carry audacious goals that you need to like think about over a long time period. I don't read many obituaries. I don't know what goes into them. Like, is it uh, is it about your Eric personality? was survived by yeah, three your life fellow story. podcasters. It's just like <laughs> you're dead now. Here's two paragraphs to sum yeah. up your entire life. Like, what yeah. are people writing about you? Which will be remembered for like two generations. And it's like an interesting concept because you have to distill like a lot into. A few lines. You have to think like, well, what? It, why am I? Why am I it's here? Crazy. What am I doing? So it's it's yeah. it. Yeah, it's. So so, what are some of the you guys? You know, obviously, like um, know him and and have followed his work much more closely. Like, what are the like top things that have stood out to you guys? Where you're like, man, that was a, a interesting or profound mm-hmm. or helpful insight or mental model or quote or uh, you know uh, even just like a tactical way that he approaches. Value investing, any anything. So even. I think that from the investing side, I think we can kind of like knock it out a little yeah. early because it's like I, I do think that his life stuff was more interesting. Okay. I think that the investing side was was basically Nick nailed it at the beginning. It's just like mm-hmm. like Warren, you're too caught up in these in these <coughs> like stupid little businesses that like you're gonna make you you know you're gonna make a profit on, but like what's what's earning forty percent when you can like compound money over a 40 year period just like buy at a reasonable price never sell i think that's like his entire investment framework in a nutshell we can like talk can we stick to it for a second yeah because like before we move on from the money part of of his um work it's like bring that to the present and bring that to like everything that you guys do today in terms of like how you approach investing 
And like, how do you square that up? Like the the, the investment style, your investment style, growing up following Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger has changed. So how do you square that up with like the the world that we live in and like coin stonk is is exploding and eth is like doing its thing and salon and like and they and they're like this is rat poison so like how do you square that up like, so i think there's like there's many threads to pull on with his investment sort of knowledge and his wisdom like one that i like is um that he he's um pretty old school in that he like he tells people to like know yourself like know exactly who you are and what your competency mm-hmm. is and one realm of that is just like um are you like a a knowledgeable investor? Because if you're not, then just diversify into index investments and and get be done with it. Mm. But for for people who are like, you know, active, he says, well, diversification is your enemy because Hmm. like you should actually follow companies that you really understand very well, that you know better than the average person and that you're willing to put a bet on, mm. and then when you're ready to bet, and when the the opportunity comes, you swing hard. And like his framework was like, the majority of my job is just reading and understanding the world, not doing anything in terms of investing, and just waiting. And when the opportunity strikes, I hit it with all my might. Interesting. Can, this can is we, not uh, something that he necessarily said. But uh, maybe he did, um, and may- or maybe Warren Buffett did. But based on their actions, here's something I also interpret um, about their um, sort of investment methodology, is that when crypto came out, when they say this is rat poison, do you know what I hear? I hear I have a core competency that I know really well. I'm going to shit on everything outside of that and just not be stupid. Like to your earlier point about like him teaching you how to not be an idiot. What he really is saying ultimately then is like, if you just learn these few things very, very, very well, everything else should be like stupid to you and outside of the realm of like what you even consider because you just don't have an advantage there. You didn't grow up in that world. So that's for like a new world. It's for a new generation. And there's obviously a new generation and they're not value investors but these guys became billionaires with this methodology of just simply not being stupid and finding companies that they truly believe in and wanting to own them. Like that's what. But it I would also to. say that like he he was a bit of a polymath in in mm-hmm. a way where he was like I want to understand sort of the the mental models of the best mental models of the world. Like so I want to understand physics. I want to understand law. I want to understand like all the things that will help me make the right choices in life. And I feel like that is sort of underappreciated now where it's like everyone's trying to specialize. Like mm, they're like, I'm an a value investor, but it, like he's a value investor too, but he's a value investor from all these different angles where he's like piecing <clears throat> together the mosaic. Yeah. I mean, I kind of agree with you, Armand. Like maybe uh, it, it's an entirely new asset class that no one necessarily knows how to value, n- knew how to value and probably to this day does, knows how to right. value. So like to him, you know, the, <laughs> the criticism he casts is like, I don't know it. This looks like an area where I could make a mistake. Just gamble. Stay away from it. Yeah. I don't know if he took the time to. Well, I think he's doing a little Pareto on crypto. It's like the the majority of it is pretty shitty, right? Right. But there there is some alpha in this industry for sure. And he's just not. He's fucking 99 years old. Like, I mean, (laughs) Charlie, God bless him, was a hypocrite on crypto because one of his basic principles was like, I should not have a strong opinion on something unless I can argue the, the opposing s- view better than my opponent one can. Of his other all time, which I think quotes. is an amazing principle, by the yeah. way. And if everybody in life was like, "I'm not going to have like a strong opinion on this unless I know my arguments better than you do, my opponent," but like he threw that out with crypto. He, you know, crypto crapo. Yeah, he, the, the, the quote. It's a very funny quote. So sometimes I call it crypto crapo. Sometimes <laughs> I call it crypto shit. Rat poison. Swore on the air. <laughs> yeah. Well, like um. But 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 that aside, like I, if if you all indulge us, like just going down the the money rabbit hole for a little bit, like I, I think there's like an interesting thing to talk about, right? Because w- crypto is obviously its own. Thing. <laughs> like it's kind of like outside the world of Munger and traditional financial assets and this like this crazy high risk island that weird people live on and like all sorts of risks are taken. But 
within crypto, there are sort of like Buffets and Mungers within crypto, like within that bubble. And then there are other people who are crazy for crypto, right? And like I, I consider myself to be like a Charlie Munger within crypto. And like I mostly am focused on like buying and holding what I think are value, you know, scare quotes, um, assets. And, and, and I think there's something to that. Um, do, do you, do you think that's like a good framework to look at it? Like that, that crypto itself, it's its own bubble and like you can buy Bitcoin and ETH and there's some other things there that what what you're talking about being a value investor in crypto like are you fucking kidding me yes. yeah, I feel that, like that implies that you can assign a value this, uh, to community right to now. bitcoin or eth yes we know it feels underpriced it feels overpriced it's below its 200 week moving average you know like things like that i i agree but like value investing implies you assign like a value Ooh. to it Based upon some actions, and I don't know, maybe we should be comparing to commodities and not stocks. Like, sure. how do you value oil, supply, and demand? Maybe that's the framework. But well, hold it's on. just hard to say. You're, you're, value you're I think you're getting too. Aren't you're getting too in the semantics of what value is, right? Like, like I think okay, you, you have a choice a where it's here. just like I believe in this overall thesis in this space, so I can invest in like the the brunt of the space, the stuff that has like Lindy basically. Or I could speculate on gaming being like a thing or this this NFT protocol is going to be a thing or like whatever. There's like 20,000 meme coins that come out. So there's a there's another um, value investor named Seth Klarman, who I, I think he's on the Mount Rushmore of, of value investors. He wrote a book. I think it's called Margin of Safety. I, ha I, I have like a digital copy. Like the, the hard copy goes on Amazon for like, a thousand dollars or something like three hundred bucks minimum. Uh, it's a cult so, book, huh? So it's a cult book. Uh, I have the digital copy, and um, in this book, he, I think he accurately describes what you're saying, where he's like, "Isn't everybody in this in the market inherently a value investor? Because you're always trying to buy value on something, like your investment. You're you're trying to identify a value, whether that's like value on growth or value on, you know, the future, like." We, we sort of misidentify value investors by saying they want like a low price to book value or, you know, you want to buy below its liquidation price or something. But it's like everyone's a value investor at the end of the day. I, I think that I align with Stephen here. It's like if you can if you can sort of identify what a, a future looks like for mm -hmm. an asset, it's like, well, yeah, the, the market cap of it today is significantly lower than what. I envision it to be and that there's value in that. Do you think like uh, you can invest in Tesla and be investing in value? No, I mean, you're, you're speculating on future growth. Like you're saying value. On what if growth. Tesla, what if we woke up tomorrow and Tesla was $5 and nothing had changed? Would you sit here and be like, no, that's not value. That is value. It is value, but why? Why is that value? I see. You're okay, saying like at so in any like, point. Let me give you a, a different example because here's something I actually literally bought uh, That's yesterday. Better. That's better. Here's something I bought yesterday. Um, <laughs> this is something you've been talking about in your friend tech uh, chat. Blur. Okay, I bought this yesterday. Mm. Blur is at 49 cents probably or something like that. I think you bought it 30 cents in your friend tech. I don't check your friend tech, but I did. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, Steven's on this. Uh, but what I saw was that the market cap is about 500 million. And its treasury is five hundred million, so that seems like a value to me. Like you're paying the treasury value for this token, and that that is a form of value. There's also a very speculative, growthy type narrative that I'm also sort of investing in. Right. But like, you can kind of identify a value there. Yeah, this is like an interesting thing we've been dealing with in crypto over the last year or two, which is that we have these projects that have treasuries which are enormous i think there are some in gaming that are this way as well it, 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 are you familiar with ygg of course or like merit circle like they I think they have like huge treasuries but it's not like you can just take over the coin and liquidate the treasury so it's not really analogous to like buying a real world company and selling off all the assets but to your point at a certain point you look at it and you go wait 
is this is this value? Yeah, it's on their balance sheet, just like cash is on Apple's balance sheet. Just because you own shares doesn't mean you could be like, if you know, force them to liquidate it and yeah, provide dividends. Like we've got distressed assets right now. You know, we've got our own little ecosystem, and within it, there have been distressed assets. Many of them are less distressed now, but it's it's been like an interesting question of like, what does that mean in the world of crypto? what actually is value if you just look at like a treasury and then there's some nuance there you know depending on how the voting is is done and, and how much like the token holders can actually control but yeah it's 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 like an interesting spot and i i think you're gonna start having like the charlie munger of crypto emerge at some point because he's not just like himself like he's a representation of like one side of like the investor psychology right totally like there are these sort of there are these different like ethoses, right? And like there's obviously like the degen, and there are tons of degens in crypto, but there is this like ethos of like I am uh, I am prudent, I am focused on value, and and you can be that way even within like a crazy space like crypto. You're going to be different than the stock guy, but like mm -hmm. but there there will be mongers nonetheless. There probably are a bunch of them out there. Who I just I just don't even know. And I think that that number is going to be growing, like over the next cycle and future cycles. Well, like, I think if you have actual more economic activity on it, you can create models. You can, you have other th things to, to, to value something on. Um, generally speaking, do you guys think in, in my mind, I know we don't get too, too caught up in semantics, but value and growth investing, like to me, 90% of investors these days are growth investors. Yeah. Right. Like, Charlie is young, not young, like, young ones. I think, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Right? Like, is it is Charlie Munger's like a dying breed? Yeah, and I wonder if that's like um, sort of like chicken of the egg. Like, you see the S and P five hundred, and you see like four hundred ninety three stocks that are actually like at zero percent return this year, and then you have like the magnificent seven that are uh, <laughs> driving the entire returns of the S and P, which is like to your point, right. all these like growthy investors are just like. I don't know, these ones are growing. And I'm, I'm more curious, like, is there anything that Charlie um, espoused that we should kind of maybe not keep? And maybe like, okay, he may have been right in his generation, but going forward in our generation, we should probably like, cool, I appreciate that. But like, I'm going to take a few of the things you said, and I'm going to leave those aside, you know. I mean, of course. And, and I think we've talked to a few of them, but like... I'd still want to focus on what he what he actually said, particularly in the life side of things. You want to go there? Yeah, because it. the life side I think is really compelling. You got any favorites? Any ones you're itching? <sighs> yeah, um, <laughs> maybe kind of like a curveball, but my favorite one of his personal favorite is um, the best way to get a good spouse is to deserve one. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to Mina. <laughs> and it's like so not like not like at her, yeah. but I just said it like, hey, here's here's a famous quote of his, and she's like, damn, that's, that's that really ties good. into one of his most epic quotes, which I feel like you would like, which mm -hmm. is like the the best way. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but the best way to get something that you want in life is to deserve it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's part of the same conversation. It's like a, yeah, it's like it's like an interesting mentality to have. Like, oh, I want this thing. Well, do you deserve it? It's all about just like. Uh, being it's like what is your state of being and what do you he's really talking about like what do you attract if you believe and you become that standard raise your standard and you will attract the life that is commensurate with that level of individual okay so whether here, it be the spouse or so the he, rewards he draws upon is this the secret I mean, well, no, because like, kind of looks like the kind of guy who'd be in the secret. <laughs> no, no, I want to, I want to like hone it because I think you would really admire this. He like he really focused on the classics, mm -hmm. so it was like Epictetus, mm -hmm. Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, and like some of the things he said was like, he's like, uh, here's another one I really liked. He's like, don't wallow in um, self pity. Okay, life is happening to all of us simultaneously in ways that is not fair and it doesn't feel right at all or whatever, but you you can't just sit there and dwell on it. You got to use it. Use it. And I think he quoted Epictetus in this one. He's like, mm. you got to use this to your benefit. And a little background on him, he lost his son to leukemia at age nine. Mm. 
Mm, yeah. And uh, was divorced around the same time and was broke around the same time. Oh, shit. And um, his, like, he, he never talked about himself, actually, in this quote. He was just saying, like, anyone can, like, use self-pity um, as, like, you know, like, like, the trains going down the tracks of depression and, like, the self-pity is just coals on on the engine to like keep the train going it's just like stop well the self pity is the quickest way to remove responsibility right to remove yourself from the fact that you can change your perspective and by changing your perspective you can change your reality and shift things but he's right like you know what's funny about people like him is a lot of people like to look at billionaires in particular and they never want to look at like the fact that everyone has some shit that they've right. gone through. Things happen to everyone. Things happen to everyone. And the fact that like he lost his son and got divorced and illnesses come up and all these things is like they just dismiss it and they call it luck so often to anyone who has success. But the reality is that the traits that you often find, the characteristic that is common in successful people is how do they cultivate a mindset that allows them to get through and persevere through the difficulties and storms of life. One of the things that's really interesting about life as we get older, I used to be, you know, like looking at people when I was, say I was in like early 20s, and you hear all these stories on the news, you hear stories of like people getting ill and things happening, and, and, it's, and it's like, oh, this, this, this doesn't affect me. This won't affect me. But the older you get and the more time goes by, the more reality starts to set in and the facts of life just begin to take a toll. Illness shows up, whether it be for you or other people or accidents happen, things happen, and it's all how you respond to it. So I, I, I love that. I think it's really cool that he... I, I, I admire the same thing about him. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to bring it up. Is like My favorite thing about him was that he admired like these great thinkers that were so lindy, their ideas were so lindy, and they stood the test of time. And I think that's where the real um, value is. And it doesn't surprise me that he became like a value investor you know, as well, like the type of person... Because that that again aligns, as yeah, you said, just, the philosophy. He's aligns. just like a hyper pragmatist, you know. He's uh, Jordan was saying this before the show. Like uh, he's like kind of stoic in a way. He's just like so pragmatic with everything that he approaches. I think another one that I liked is um, he said that of all the the deadly sins, he thinks envy is the stupidest one. Yes. He's like because this one has no upside. All you do is you look at somebody else and you're like. God, I wish I had that. You yeah, don't said, want to be that person. That's the, the funniest part. The world about is not envy. run by greed, which most people think it's ruled by envy. Dude, the yeah, funniest that, part that's about an envy. Interesting thing, have you guys yeah. ever thought about this? You find one thing that you admire about somebody, and you want that thing, and you're envious of it. And this is common with people who have envy. They never consider the fact that it's the whole package. You have to totally. take all of it. Yeah. You have to take their wife. You have to take <laughs> their kids. You have to take their illness. You have to take their misfortune. Yeah, maybe they can't you sleep don't at night. Just yeah. get you, you never know the thing, the jet. You don't just get the bank account. You get all of it. You get the personality traits. You get the upbringing. You get the anxiety. You can't just trade like the, the whole concept of envy is so ridiculous. Man, I, I kind of honestly feel that I turned more from a child into a man when I got over the envy part. So, you know, we were hanging out at the same time. I started a company in my like mid twenties and it did really well. And I was surrounded by people who were like making money also. And I, and early on, you know, you're making X amount, but then you hear someone making two X amount and three X amount. And you start to think about it. Well, like, why, why am I not making that much? And, and then me and my business partner over a couple of years, we go, you ever get the sense that everyone's just kind of like lying and just showing off and and we kept every time we heard someone talk about how much money they're making like, talk about top line revenue a lot yeah <laughs> top line revenue and it just kind of swarms and it's like all this like gunk in your head and it just gets put into this envy bucket yeah and then you're just wondering like why don't i have more like i'm i i have the skills i have the resources like why am i not there where that person or this group of people is but then this powerful things happens and you, you could shove it aside in many different ways. We use this quote like, oh, you hear this business is doing this well? Like, well, everybody lies. Like, you don't know that's actually true. Yeah. And then we would just put it aside. And once we were able to do that, uh, me and my business partner, Daniel, just put aside all of it. I think we be, became like adults mm. and we became on our own path. And that power of shoving aside envy 
I think is one of the most but, powerful things. But think things. about what's happening. Like envy is an energy and not to get too metaphysical here, but literally it's, 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 it's mental capacity and time and energy is going towards something that's outside of what's in your lane. When you take your focus off of like your goal, basically what you just described is the moment we stopped caring and looking left and right, we got more successful and more fulfilled. It's like, yeah, mm. duh. Just, that is like becoming a man. You're right. <laughs> There's like trade-offs to, to, trade to envy. You know, the trade-off is not enjoying the, even if it's little success that well, you're, you're having on your own. Because you know? I think his point that I loved was that he's, he's actually specifying envy because that's the one that doesn't even have any upside. Like, right. I, I don't even know the seven deadly sins because right. I'm not Catholic or whatever that is. What is it like? <laughs> gluttony. Gluttony is one of them. You are a gluttonous. Lust, but I love gluttony. Good, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. I love to overindulge. You guys have seen it probably on a podcast, maybe like five times. <laughs> so, like, well, you're I, going to hell. Yeah, I so, love that stuff. Fun. But like, envy is the one that like it doesn't even serve you in the short term. Like, there's nothing. Good there. Yeah, like if if you're no. motivated by greed, it might hone your focus to like accomplish a specific goal. But what does envy get you? Just right down only. Yeah, yeah. That one, that one, um, that one sat with me the most, and I never heard it before until I was kind of reading through his quotes. But I was yeah. like, man, when I got past that, it felt really good. It come it comes from this interview where he's like, he's actually postulating like an interesting thing, which is like he's going through the last few hundred years. He's like, wow, capitalism has produced. So much wealth, so much prosperity, so many more people can eat, so many more people can live good lives. And he's like, and on average, people are not happier. Oh, yeah. Why? And then he's cause like, oh, he's like, oh, well, they, he's, he, his basic conclusion is, it, oh, it just shows you that the driver of everything is not greed. Because if people got more of what they supposedly wanted, they would sort of be satiated. But, it, but it's envy. Because envy <laughs> is this thing that is... It's insatiable. It's relative. It's relativistic. So no matter what, how much you have, as long as some, as as long as somebody next to you has more, then you feel discontent, and then that is the thing that, and and when he uh, when he said that, it reminded me like I was I I make fun of um <laughs> like my girlfriend a lot with like the you know we know like girls on social media they're always like looking at other girls oh, yeah. like all the time and they're just like. Oh, she's so skinny. Oh, her this, this. Oh, this like all day. And I was like, you know, I like laugh about it a lot. And then I realized the other day, I'm like, oh, this is just what I do on crypto Twitter. <laughs> like people post a PNL. I'm like, oh, the meme coin. Oh, I missed <laughs> yeah. it. Like, oh, God, like, I should have bought oh, that. Oh, <laughs> I didn't buy enough Solana. Oh, this. And it's just like the this is like a it's like a bull market thing. It's just this pain. Like you're you can't be happy with your own gains. You are just envious. Like in social media for women is an envy machine, but social media for men, like in crypto Twitter especially, is also an envy machine. And it's not just crypto Twitter, it's like all of fin twit Twitter. I think it's fin all of, Twitter. It's just all of everything, but the I think you're right. The the, the aims are different. With girls it's like it can be looks based, with guys it can be financial based. Yeah, it's like that guy's getting richer than me. What the hell? He seems stupid. I'm not <laughs> stupid. Well, I'm smarter than him. Why is he richer than me? Is he richer than me? And it's the same thing where people are, you know, like where where girls might post like filters and stuff. Like, well, guys post like Photoshop trading screenshots and like all sorts of other nonsense. And or they don't they admit the 20 trades that they <laughs> lost. And you could drive yourself crazy thinking about all the things you didn't invest in, all the things you didn't buy, or you gotta take a step back and like, wait, why am I here? What am I doing? Long run. Yeah, I, I we I always try to think. There's always someone who's gonna make more money than you. There's always gonna be someone who makes less money than you. And once you can get okay with that, specifically the people who make more than you, you kind of like go back into your own flow of like what you do best, how you think about things. And I've been thinking about that lately. I actually was going back to the Bankless episode we did with David when we were on Bankless. And we were talking about, um, well, where do you see the market going? Okay, and and if we do go into a bear market, what do you? What's your perspective going to be? And I think on it, I said something like, ah, I'll just buy it if it gets below the 200-week moving average. And I was like, man, why didn't I stick through that through this last like year and a half? Start buying when it's below. That's what I said originally when I was like in a clear mind. That sounds and then, like it would have been pretty good. It usually is pretty good. It's not. Yeah perfect no but it's pretty good no. and uh i, I don't know no maybe i i got caught up like you're saying just like watching people make money on certain things and and 
and getting greedy or envious. I don't well, that, know. That's Life not is mostly that's distracting. Not yeah. uh, honestly, there's uh, the only thing I can think of that's good about envy is that if you can turn it into like a motivational fuel to accomplish more. But on the other side of the goal of accomplishing more is what is enough. And one of the most important questions mm. in life good is one. what is enough. So you're on, you're especially as a young person in life, you're always balancing in, in this game of like achievement oriented roller coaster junkie versus like what is enough. And there's only so much time you have to work really fucking hard. And so most young people tend to choose the track of achievement you know, junkie on this roller coaster, but that comes with very little fulfillment and very little feeling of like what is enough. And most people don't define what is enough. And the more they look left and right and they have access to crypto, Twitter, and Instagram, they're constantly told that there's this other way and that there's a way to be better. To, no matter what you do, whether you're a guy or a girl, girls are like, oh, she's skinnier than me. She has bigger boobs than me. Guys are like, oh, he's more jacked than me or he's taller than me or he has more money than me or his car or whatever. Or, you know, his pr whatever. Everyone's always comparing something. Wait, is, is what? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's always comparing something. And it's endless. It's just, it's endless and it's stupid. So I think like removing that from the psyche is one of the most important things to so do. Here's, I've done it by deleting social media. But so here's like a a retort, but I agree with you. But here here's like a another Charlieism where he says like if you can just wake up every day and go to sleep wiser than you were when you mm -hmm, woke up, mm -hmm. that is that is still um, this never ending cycle of like more, mm -hmm. but it but it's not outcome oriented. It's like yes, uh, I'm just like. So this, process or it's it's personal growth bring and, up but you're like, not comparing right you're not comparing to someone else's like my, my favorite word in the office when we achieve something is progress because like progress is what makes you actually feel happy like happy. For, for me it it feels happy and you know when you when you have a goal of like increasing net income to endless levels it's hard to motivate people around that and get people happy around just making the number go up obviously everyone's makes a little more money but like when you can consistently show you yourself and your own company and your group that you're achieving with, we made progress today. Dude, hundred percent. And like every day I get a chance where it does actually feel like progress. I'm like progress. I say it out loud progress. Cause it, it, it actually makes you happy. And so you can avoid that, that out. If you avoid the outcome of like, well, is this number enough? Is that number enough? Mm. Dude, just want to comment on this because <laughs> by the way, I don't do social media anymore. Although I am doing LinkedIn. And LinkedIn pops, so follow me on LinkedIn, Armand Asadi. <laughs> and I, there are these like pop ups. What, you can't shill a profile? No, I love it. I love it. I just never heard anyone say the whole on LinkedIn. What do you Armand post Asadi. on LinkedIn? <laughs> you sound older than Charlie. <laughs> Seven mind blowing new AI tools that are sure to blow your mind. It's the same goddamn shit that's on every other platform. <laughs> so um, it's actually a little less cringe. It's a little less cringe. There's no way. Link LinkedIn is the most cringe no, platform. No, it's a little less cringe. Um, so there are these, Jordan knows, so there are these things that pop up where it's like there's a, a, a sort of crowdsourced article being created, and then it says, like, do you want to contribute to this article, which is within your expertise? And it'll have, like, sections of the article... So today's was like, um, you know, how do you retain top talent and build a great team? And I, I wrote, I was like, you don't do it by just like competing with perks and, and, and pay. Like nobody cares about KPIs, really. Nobody's motivated by KPIs. People are motivated by, am I actually, like how, how do you give feedback in a way where the person feels like they're growing and progressing, that they're being challenged like at the core, fundamentally growing every day personally, and that they're being held accountable and working with people around them that are working at the same level. The moment somebody looks to their left and right and the person next to them isn't working as hard, they don't work as hard. And the moment that they stop receiving feedback that is clear that they're being held accountable and to a high standard, they start slacking off. So I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen a super smart, talented person just like fade into oblivion and become bored because they're not they're not working hard. They're not they're not being held accountable. So, I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah, and it, it kind of uh, creates this like video game framework, right? Where like you you want to make progress in the video game, and you want to do it with your teammates, and you don't want it to be too hard where you don't make progress, and too easy where it's like, well, well yeah, of course we make progress. Things too too easy. Yeah. And so I don't know. I I, I like that. 
that framework that do you that believe jumped. in this like video game style uh gamify life in a yes. way where you like are constantly trying to achieve the next level yeah why not i i think it's a beautiful thing like okay it, there's something to what you said like when you were talking about incrementalism mm -hmm. earlier i was like oh my god this is why crypto is so fucking painful because you just get a flood of dopamine and then you just die for years. <laughs> and there's no incrementalism. It's just you are dead and then it's euphoria and then you're like dead again. And like video games are designed so that you like level up. You get like you go boop, 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 yeah, the, boop, boop, boop. And that like is gratifying. You get a little win, a little win. Yeah, you're a in the win. game or it's game over. And, and the, if you're in the game, you're progressing. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just playing, you're just playing like a casino game. You're just playing yeah. roulette. You're just betting everything on double zero, and it's just mostly pain. And then you get a huge payday, and then you're just like, it's "Where's the fun. payday? Where's the payday?" But you is turn it, into like an isn't that game. similar to early life, where you like you go from first grade to second grade, second grade to third grade? Isn't and, what and similar? Is, is that the, the video the game? Roulette? Like yeah, the no the game the gamification of oh, a linear yeah. path. Yeah, that, like, and that, and that's good. And then it stops, like then college ends, and then it's like. Now you're in an open world. Yeah, so well, it doesn't stop no, necessarily. You, yeah. You're still in this like I need to go up the ladder of success, and I think we're going to get to this with the yeah. Let's let's talk about it because let's yeah. I think uh, Benjamin Franklin has this quote: um, "Most people die at 25, and aren't buried until they're 75." Um, Shots and I, fired. I, I take that to mean like they physically die at 75, but they kind of stop living the game of life at 25 and. You know, the guy who posted this um, has some some charts up here that you spend most of your time with friends in the first 25 years of your life. You spend the most time with your parents and siblings and family in the first 25 years of your life. You know, towards the end of your life, you stop spending, maybe when you're 40, 50, you stop spending time with your children, coworkers. Um, and as time goes on, you kind of spend more and more time alone. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how maybe video gaming gamifying your life is a way a a out of that kind of issue so i guess the the first issue is like do you guys agree that like at a certain age was 25 30 or whatever you kind of stop having this this fun part of of uh being engaged with the game and being into the game and really playing it or are you just kind of going through the motions after a certain age because of just the human experience of the way it exists right now. I, I don't agree with the guy, the take the guy had. I don't think that's what that quote means, personally. Not to me. It's up for what do you think? It, I'm curious what you think it means, because that's all that I took from it. I, I think that Ben Franklin is speaking to spirit. The spirit of a human being is like, like when a, you a die, real thing. When you die at 25... Your, your spirit is dying. Your spirit's like, dying. What you have until the age of 25 is unlimited optimism, curiosity. Like, especially when you are a child in your teenage years and your adolescent years, in particular, until you become an adolescent and you get shaped by life, what you are overflowing with is, is curiosity. And you're rewarded by your environment for that. When you're a child, like I have a baby right now, she's looking at stuff and I am cultivating, yes, good, that's great. This is an apple. This is an orange. This is tequila. Enjoy. Have a little. <laughs> um, and, and that curiosity being cultivated is a wonderful thing. And they ask questions. And they're told, if they have good people around them, to ask more questions and to become more curious. But eventually, that person becomes annoying to society. They get in the way. And they start asking questions that take up too much time or they become rebellious. In particular, let's just use myself. I am an extremely rebellious person whose spirit was crushed by society at a young age. Every single door I tried to open in my adolescent years was smashed in my face. Every question I asked, You're I was talking told, at 25. Year I'm talking up pre, until I'm pre talking pre-25. And my my spirit should have died at 25. This is what most people go through, in particular if they are rebellious and overly curious about the world. I mean, I'm talking. In, you know, in it wasn't until actually coming to San Diego State and having a few professors that were like, okay, you're really fucking different. Let's try to find a way to like make this something and like find like what's unique about you and like 
like like celebrate it a little bit like you probably used to when you were a child. And unfortunately, a lot of people grow up in a family situation where they're curious and they get punished even in their zero to 10 years. So imagine like if you go through this, if you're, if you go through this, whether or not it, it, you're celebrated for being curious as a child, and then you become an adolescent and you start getting in trouble or you, you, you're being told to stop asking certain questions, get in line, sit down, detention, don't do it like that, sit this way. It's a 50 minute class, don't be late, do this. All these rules, all that does is it removes your ability to like explore life. Life becomes less malleable to you and it's fixed and you're a cog in a machine. And what ultimately happens is Alan Watts talks about in multiple videos, in particular, like probably his most famous one. If you want to start with Alan Watts, the best video ever is like uh, I'll have to pull up the title. Maybe Jordan can can put it in the in the in the description. But it's basically the journey of going through the the you know the the elevator of success of life and like why your spirit gets crushed and why you end up becoming this like dead at twenty five person. And he perfectly explains it. It's like life is this dance you were dancing all along and you were being curious and eventually life just like conformed you and was like this is the path because it became like if you're not an a student then i don't have time for you uh, from the professor standpoint there's it's one like, way I'm, i just want to i just want to help the a them. student because you're lost yeah there's ways. one roadmap yeah there's one way of learning there's one way of acting and, and being civilized in society and if you don't do it this way we don't really have a place for you. And so what everyone's doing is everyone's wearing a fucking mask. Everyone's wearing a mask. And people feel dead inside. And that's what I think Ben Franklin's talking about. It's like a, it's like a death of creativity thing? You think that, that that's what it is? It's like a death is, of or? self? It's, it's, yes, it's like, like a what death it, of self. What, what does that mean, death of self? Like... What what is the self? What, well, what is it that dies? What, as I as I'm hearing it, Armand himself is different than this cookie cutter like <clears throat> guy who gets A's, goes through class, gets gets follows the, all the rules, follows all the rules exactly as they're prescribed, and gets the job. Yeah, does, does the it thing. does it the exact way that it was prescribed? Armand has a lot of fucking capacity and potential. But it wasn't unleashed until somebody recognized, hey, there are alternate paths. For I recognize like it that. every time we are at a restaurant, we can't get a table. We, <laughs> we, we joke. So Armand's got this alternative uh, personality we call Wolf or Wolfie. And uh, when, Wolfie. when the rules don't bend to our nature, Armand goes into wolf mode. Well, the world and is quite malleable And he just goes and gets things done. He's like, I figured it out. We got a table. I'm like, well, how did you get us a table? He's like, well, I, live, I talked to her. I told her there's other in, ways of making this work. Like, you move that thing and see if you I just get I live in a creative. world like the world like my dad grew up in, like in like the 70s. Like in the 70s, like, and in older times, like, there weren't rules the way there are rules today where things are very strict. It was all about relationship and and like, you know, you could go to the airport and like walk up to the gate and be like, eh, can I get on the flight? Oh, yeah, we got one more. It wasn't like, oh, we got 18 pounds left. It was like, yeah, sure, let's figure it out. I live in that world where it's like, let's figure it out. We can figure it out. And if no one gets hurt and we all win, let's just figure it out. And I've seen like, you do it a hundred times. <laughs> like, uh, like the track record is flawless. Like, that's the third door, though. We've talked about the it's third exactly door. Exactly. That's door. the third door. And if you're willing to look for it and talk to people and explore it with them and charm them a little bit or do it your way, like that's just the way I do it is like it, it works and it leads to great success. We're getting off, I know, off the topic yeah, a little I'm, bit. I'm still unclear on why you die. Like what makes you I think die? To, is, to, is to summarize it, of... again, this is just my perspective. I, I want yours. I want to know what, what you think about this quote and why people die at 25. But in my opinion... It's because what dies inside of them is their spirit. And the spirit wants to grow and create in a way that is like natural to them, innately how they want to express themselves in the world. And because the world and society is so confining and constraining to a certain set of rules, they're beaten down. And the more they get beaten down and they're forced to become the square to fit, their spirit begins to die. And by the time they get to 25, they say, you know what? Let me just work the system. Let me just do the thing to live my life, not cause any trouble, get the paycheck, and move the fuck on. 
But you know what happens? They spend the next 50 years miserable, miserable. And if you look around, unfortunately, today, this is a whole other tangent, but everyone is either narcissistic, anxious, or depressed. But, but what is it that makes you alive? Is it that you have a dream? Is it that you have like a weird? Well, wasn't it you said like your, uh, the first word you used? It's kind of like you're inverting, like a little Charlie Mungerism here. You're kind of inverting the situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, like yeah, it. the Charlie Munger thing would be to say like you're you're about to die and you feel very alive. Why? What did you do that made you feel so good? I mean, I think the video game analogy comes back. Like the best video games in the world are addicting. Okay, but isn't that like a trick? Where you're going, but you, but the thing is, I, I, it is a trick that you can use. You yeah. should use. It's a tool to try to design your life in a way that is addicting. And if you described your life like I'm addicted to the life I've created, I think that's a that that pretty good place. In to my do. view, that is precisely what kills people. Is like incrementalism, but like a negative incrementalism. It's just like just. Go to, you know, just just do your homework. Just get good grades. Just go to a good college. Graduate from a good college. Just work at a consulting firm. Just get that intro. Just get a promotion. Just make partner. Just do this. You it's you incremental you increment yourself to to death in a way. Like you keep getting a carrot dangled in front of you. I, if you're asking here, about here, the here. dream, I do think that another part of what makes people die at 25 is that they let too many of their dreams die. Yes. They mm. give up on those dreams and they just go, eh. And you can feel it. I, I like think, you're in a conversation with someone. Yeah, I always wanted to do that. And I always say to people, why the fuck? Okay, I, I want to ask you that. I want to ask you this because, like, I've had this conversation with a lot of people. And the first thing they always say to me is, like, yeah, but then, like, I had a kid. Dot, dot, dot. The end. That, that's just no question. That I'm a not kid the first person life. anymore. I that can't do this anymore. I need stability. Blah, 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 and then, no poof, question. You know, you know, no question. It changes your life. But there's a whole group of people that say, "Have babies, have kids, we'll travel," and that's their motto, and they just do it. But but also <laughs> like maybe they happily replace that baby's. You know the they replace the selfishness with building that baby, like making sure that all that baby's potential is maximized and whatever their life will be, they're, they're happy to replace oh, it. I I've, could, I could I've see had friends. That. I could see that. I don't replace. have a baby. That's different ha than the person who resents it. So I don't even have a baby, yeah. but I can imagine, because like I'm, I'm in this place now where it's like, yeah, if my life keeps incrementally getting better, that's still the same chapter of the same book, essentially. Hmm. Like I, I'm kind of ready to turn the page like, to I'm, like I'm, a different chapter where it's like, this new thing is going to be completely different. I, I, I think that's a that's, good analogy. That's for, exciting for like, kids, actually. That's yeah. exciting to me. Don't, don't yeah. you think like most everybody Ben Franklin was talking about, like had a kid in those At times? At age 25. Yeah. Like, yeah. Pretty so much all of them. Clearly there's something. <laughs> I think you're reading into this. <laughs> <laughs> Steven's getting the points. So when they I have a kid, I die inside. Had kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what I'm saying at all. It's like, I knew it. <laughs> uh, God. <laughs> um, so hold on, Stephen. What was your take on this idea that people like, or do you disagree entirely? Like that people die at age twenty-five metaphysically, but then don't die until seventy-five with their like physical body. Well, I don't disagree with that, but I'm trying to think what it is that I agree with specifically. Like I, I think most people I encounter in the world are like glorified algorithms for the most part, they have like a few inputs that they <laughs> are that striving First to. Of all, that has to be acknowledged as hilarious, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Like We're I feel like NPCs. everybody is on autopilot for the most part, not everybody, but a lot, they, they just are. And they have like these little desires that are programmed and they go acquire them and they do this and they're, they're, they're risk averse and they're cornered into this thing and, and, and they don't, think a lot about what they're doing or why people aren't the other thing is that people aren't super introspective like most people like there's a lot of people not a lot of people who like talking to me when i have like six glasses of wine at dinner because like i just start saying weird shit and they're like yo man i don't want to i don't want to talk about an this. algorithm man. It's like, <laughs> fuck. like but like six glasses of wine you just, weird. just becomes like at dinner after six glasses of wine steven just becomes like white thomas soul <laughs> 
It's like the perfect way to encapsulate it. That's you the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. Thank every you. Every white liberal woman there just like, appalled. Dude, <gasps> appalled. Paul <Appalled. gasps> <Appalled. laughs> <laughs> just starts saying all these things. That I'm changing that to my Twitter bio. <laughs> white Thomas Soul <laughs> After is six like, glasses of wine. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah, you would have loved being a fly on the wall at our dinner the I've other night. I've been to a couple of them, brother. I've been to a couple of them. <laughs> It's uh, it's uncomfortable. Okay, so, so I have a great time. Hold on, let yeah. me hone in on this because I actually completely agree with you that most people turn into this sort of like monotonous robot that does what is expected. And I'm I guess I'm asking, is that the death? Because that to me feels like death in a way. You're you have you lose autonomy. You lose the ability to choose a path. The path is now chosen, and you just execute function. Yeah, like you've you given just, up your you decision making. Enter power. Yeah. for forty years. Wait. If you get, have we talked about the movie Yes Man before? I feel like I'm having like a. Is that know, Jim Carrey? I know we've talked about it. I don't yeah. know if we've talked about it on the show. I don't, I don't know. know. I, I love the movie. that movie. It's, I know like, the movie. it's like kind it's an of a shitty movie. movie that you watched on an airplane. No, but, no, no. But that is a very good movie. But it has this element to it that's like, whoa. No, that like, movie's deep. And that reminds me of what you like. You're like most people don't want to say yes to a bunch of stuff. I, I think partially because fear, but partially because they lo- they mostly because they love the structure. They love the the walls that have been built up. Like, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. Like, I, I I put this input in, I get this input out, right? And to just, like, tear that all off and just say yes to everything, like in the movie, where the guy just says yes to everything. Oh, dude. And it just goes Remember off Remember when we rails. brought up Walter Mitty and yeah. we got shit on by my brother's friend? For oh, my God, that's <laughs> a great movie. movie. <laughs> we loved Wait, it. I've never seen Walter so Mitty. So we brought up Walter Mitty in one episode, and my brother and his friend John... We're like, dude, we gotta watch this movie. Like these, you know, the guys are pumping it up. Like we've never seen it before, and they watched it and they. Hated it. Where's the action, they bro? Where's the explosions? It. They hated it. No, I think they were just expecting something. I don't know. It wasn't for them. It's not for everybody. So with Yes Man, I also give that caveat of like, it's not for everybody. But I found but it Yes Man is not deep. supposed to be good. So like when you watch it, you're like. No, it's like oh. un- it's like unintentionally good. It's like yeah, yeah there's actually something deep here. Even though it's kind of a shitty movie, but Wait, like, you don't think there was an intention to transmit that message? That no, movie? no, I, I okay. do. Okay, I do. And like, I, I watched too. it. It's like it. I, I had like a weird. It's a moment. Jim Carrey movie. Jim Carrey's a deep motherfucker. Yeah, Excuse it was me, like a rever- it was like a reverse Barbie, yeah. where you're supposed to watch Barbie and get this message, but it's actually shit. <laughs> Where it's like, yes, man, you're just like, ah, it's some dumb comedy. And you're like, wait, why do I feel so moved by what's happening right now? What is happening? I'm having an existential crisis. good point. Uh, Have you guys ever incorporated that into your life? Because I'm going to say this now. I don't don't think my wife listens to this outside of when she's with your girlfriend. Oh, definitely not. Right. uh, You're safe. You're safe. I'm super safe, too. I think I'm in a safe space right now. Um, So with an ex, we used to have um, yes, yes days. It was just like yes, man, but it would be for a day where like anything. Wait, that you, sounds anything you say is the answer is yes. Like anything that comes across your path, it's a yes, and Wait, it just how did that go? Just leads to adventure, <laughs> and it's so. What's anal like? <laughs> it requires a lot of trust in the other person, right? Yeah, but these yeah, like, these yes days were like the best days. I whispered it, but I'm sure it still oh, came across. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick, I'm sure the oh. mic that's right <laughs> in front of your mouth. I want to say it. Kind of want to say it. <laughs> that was amazing. Oh. <laughs> oh. Just whispered it into a microphone. Oh, my God. You just gave me so, <laughs> so many no, ideas but, yeah. for yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Tom, yesterday. Nom, Tom Nom's energy. Tom Nom's energy. Tom Nom Nom. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it like, I tell you what it's like, brother. <laughs> So oh, what I think, oh what I think is like exactly like you guys all have elements of oh. how I feel about this like death at twenty five, but like if you don't like capture some adventure, whimsical type of like unexpectedness in your post twenty five life, it will feel like death. And like yeah. a tool like a yes day is a way to be like, holy fuck, that's a great tool. We are still alive because children do that. <clears throat> Children inherently do that because you like they just are chaos. <laughs> yeah, they have to be told. But they haven't been no. told they, they, no they a million times yes by society. Yes is the default. Yes, yes, yes is, is the, the default. default. The default is I can do this. I can say this. I can jump off this. I think that's <laughs> another. I think that's another reason why the spirit dies. So in the post, the guy mentions some possible solutions. One of them he says rituals, mm-hmm. like um, if you're not religious, like. Maybe a yes day is part of a ritual, but he also talks about like uh, 
you know, in Jewish culture, they get together on Fridays. The whole family gets together, has dinner. That, like, brings more engagement, more life into your life. Um, he talks about celebrating big milestones. Like, maybe there's more of these rituals that you could bring in to, like, be more engaged. But I guess we still have to figure out, like... Oh, what I, I you ri- reminded me of something. I was listening to... Uh, uh, Lex, as I don't do too often anymore. Love Lex. I mean, who has seven hours? Yeah. <laughs> what, he it, is it, such a good interviewer. It was the thing I shared with Marty was like a... Uh, it, oh, Marty's going to hate that I said that. Lex. Um, Mar- Marty hates Lex. Marty I think he's Lex. fine. It's okay, um, though. I love Marty. <laughs> but Marty's uh, gone, you guys. What are, yeah, you, he, talking he had, what are uh, you talking about? Marty's right here. He's listening right now. Trust me. You, you think he's listening? Marty, shout out know. on Twitter if you're listening. <laughs> um... Yeah, so he had Michael Malice on, and he said something that I thought was like interesting. He's like, every time I have a great thing happen in my life, I buy myself something beautiful, ooh, and then I put it in my house. Something beautiful, beautiful, yes, not Amazing. something expensive. Buy something yeah, like beautiful. So like he so it, like every time he a looks Rolex around, can be beautiful, Nick. His yeah. life. <laughs> There are these things. It's like, oh, that is from when I did this. That is from when I did that. Because it's so easy to forget without the physical reminder. And I thought that was really cool, actually. And it's something I would like to start mm. doing. Because like, I have a habit of being like, <clears throat> don't even dwell on this. What's the next thing? Totally. Like, you don't you no, just move on. You have to celebrate. You have to celebrate. I like that. Um, Nick, you mentioned like rituals for non-religious people. There's yeah. literally a book about this. Really? The Daughter of Carl Sagan, My Hero. Uh, one of them, Carl Sagan, and his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> She's not my hero. Um, um, I don't even know what she looks like. What's her name? I was gonna make a joke, but I don't she know would what she be looks more like. of a hero if you knew what she looked like. No, <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, is that what you said? <laughs> no, it's not what I oh said. My God, don't freaking CNN me right now. Um, <laughs> Sasha Sagan, for small creatures such as we, rituals for finding meaning in our unlikely world. It is literally a book that studies all the different yeah what does she look like cute very nice um studies all the rituals and all the cultures and all the things like jewish culture and and irish culture and persian culture and all the different things that they do to find meaning that are not you know strictly related to, to religious activities and like basically as a person who doesn't prescribe to religion you're role is to pick and choose and create your own culture that's something i believe too like very deeply yeah and so she has a whole book about this so i would highly recommend it. i really enjoyed the book those sound interesting because my biggest fear about dying at 25 and being buried at 75 is that your relationships die off because of the natural curve of the human experience like your your circles get tighter you have less time to spend with people and that's like that's my biggest fear because you know you you miss out on the joy of having those relationships, but then you also do this thing where you kind of put all your needs on your partner, like your your wife or your mm. husband, where you're like, okay, well, I don't get the chance to chop it up with the boys or, or you know, talk at work and get this kind of, maybe it's intellectual stimulation or anything else or emotional support. And so now it is on all on your partner to provide your, your things. And that to me is kind of a high bar to put on yes. your partner to be your career advisor, your best friend, your lover, your, the place where you get intellectual stimulation. Like, it, it, it's a lot. It's and too so, much weight on one person. Oh, it's, like, it's like hiring one person to take on seven roles. You would never do that in your company. You yeah, know? and so, you know, I, I hope that I'm able to, like, maintain those relationships, but I've already seen in the last couple of years, it's just a little tougher. Do you to, think that um, the majority of people have this what you're describing this outlet where it's like um, my cups are filled from like multiple sources. Like my wife fills this cup and then my <clears throat> alfalfa friends fill this other cup. And then, yeah. you know, I have, well, like, no, cause they're all talking to AIs. It's like the biggest thing in the world. It's like right nobody now. has friends to begin with. I think the younger Wait, generation what? doesn't have this. <laughs> <laughs> so I studied this like a couple weeks ago cause I was trying to Whoa. figure out why like character AI and these AI companion bots, not ChatGPT, like the ones where you talk to something or someone are so popular. And um, I think there's like an epidemic of isolation. 
and no one wants to talk about it. And I tried to talk to people like Gen Z alpha people and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never touched that app. And it's like, uh, the data says your generation is like constantly on this. But then I realized, of course, they're not going to acknowledge that. Like this is like a secret sort of outlet for for people so i think that it's like a very common because and then i was studying the psychology of like what what do you get out of that like what does a person get out of that acknowledgement companionship recognition accountability yeah you know especially as the memory increases of this thing and it really becomes like adapted to becoming your best friend like i think that's amazing yeah. i don't want to go on any no, AI tangents you're proving the data shows that maybe most people don't have don't that, right? but i think that maybe our generation or or yeah, older, it's, it's the younger generation. What happens is what yeah. Nick is talking about, where you just start to drift apart, and it takes a tremendous amount of work to cultivate and maintain something like this, and, and the, it requires and, ritual. And the bandwidth it's is ritual. always getting smaller and smaller because your responsibilities get larger and larger. At, like as you add a uh, roomie to your That's mix, right. like your bandwidth is getting tighter, That's so you right. have to be a little more proficient with your allocation of your time right? yeah I'll, I'll be honest with you why am i here why am i here in san diego and why do i live in bankers hill actually for the most part is to be able to do this if you guys didn't exist and i didn't have friends in san diego dude i'd go pay one tenth of the price to live somewhere else and buy a mansion like this is insane. We're in like the most expensive city in America. Oh my god! I live you... in a two bedroom apartment, paying you don't even want to know for like, you know, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Like, I just want to say with that a baby, uh, like, like a close friend of ours just uh, is about to close on a place for a hundred and eighty dollars per square foot. Where in North Carolina? What country? And it is <laughs> fucking beautiful. Hundred eighty. Wow. And I, like. To I'm par 10x that, that we're 12, 1200 square foot. Yeah. No, yeah. no, it's like yeah. a it's a yeah, mansion. You're in a twelve hundred square foot. I'm in an apartment. It's a mansion like, that they're paying 180 a square foot. It's in, absurd. In like a, a reasonable city in North Carolina, and we're 10x that in a, my neighborhood in San Diego, which isn't even like the best neighborhood. Yeah. So so to close that point, it's just like you you have to commit to this idea. Like I think my my concern of losing connection is greater than than that like i i prefer this so i'm yeah. willing to be here and i'm willing to pay the price or whatever and stick to this city and all these things because it's like i believe that what will make me happier and a better person in the long run is by like having the ritual of friendship and community the people ask me all the time my my parents ask me my friends you know in northern california ask me why don't you live in sacramento like what are you doing you could be near your parents you'd have help for your baby why are you in a different city than your family is and i'm like we had the same conversation in the office talking about don't get how much it is it's 1200 a square foot here to buy a home and i think there was some chat in the discord about buying versus renting and i was like chopping up in the office how i have this framework we started talking about it and then we all came to the same conclusion yeah if everyone would move to a cheaper place i'd go you'd have to all do it as one <laughs> as one as one um but I, I'm happy to know you at least signed millions of dollars to this, our this friendship. This is the idea, by, by I do. <laughs> the idea I've had where you just like get a bunch of your friends together and you just go make some commune somewhere out and you build like 12 houses and... <clears throat> Network it, it just sounds a little too hippie. Is there like a less hippie version Maybe of that? Maybe the hippies have it right, man. I don't know. <laughs> they seem pretty happy. I don't know. They do weird things. Like what? It gets a little weird. They the, diddle each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they do they, diddle each other. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They got Armand, nothing else. There's Armand no local bar. Diddling. There's no local bar. It's <laughs> like I'm ready. I'm ready to diddle. <laughs> yeah, it gets weird, dude. You guys ever seen the movie Knock Around Guys? No. It's kind of like fourth tier movie, but anyway, these uh, city guys go into a small town. They get in some trouble, but like I imagine, like if you move to some small, you know, I don't know, rural area of North Carolina at 188 dollars a square foot. Kind of feel like that. You it's not that it's Charlotte. I mean, it's not Is that it Charlotte. Yeah. Oh man, like downtown Charlotte? No, but like, like forty-five minutes outside. No, Charlotte. like not. I don't even think that much. But just like Charlotte. I have some alpha though. Um, Hit me. If you don't have this, one of the things you and I used to do <clears throat> is even if you're in a different city, mm. and I think at that time we were, we would do these weekly calls. 
So you could just get like four friends, five friends together that you have a similar mindset and you have your own alfalfa situation with, you know, whatever's the common thread between you. Maybe you met on our Discord. Maybe you met on Twitter, whatever it is, right? Uh, maybe you know them from college, but you lost touch. Hit them up, create a little group and just like do this like, and you can be one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't have to be four or five people, but like we used to do this and we used to just check in and we had a simple format. Here's what, here's what was a challenge for me. Here's what went well, and here's my plan next week. And like, maybe does one person have um, one main topic that we can all just like explore, kind of like what we do on this podcast? And we just like do it. Let's explore this. You got to find people as weird as Benjamin. you are. Though. Yeah, super weird. Yeah. We're super fucking weird. <laughs> okay, but like, you, gotta, sounds... you find those and you do that, and you set an hour aside for that, and then you get that connection and that feeling that like you're growing. And but you, even you then, like, if you like remember of that group. four. You know, one or two of those, I had a close connection with you. We were, we were good friends, but like I didn't really have like a close That's connection, right. but it was a very purposeful group because I was like shared the most intimate problems. I was like, I have this fucking problem. It won't go away. And then you have this person who you don't really have a lot of rapport with, but if they're as weird as you are and they get the purpose of like, okay, we're a little mastermind group, if you will. So yeah. I guess I have a question. It works. I have it a works. question. Like, is it... <laughs> Is that more... Steven, if you're weirded out by that, you're not ready for the hippie no, commune. I was, the hippie I was, commune I was, is so different. He's ready to diddle everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, just, I was just laughing. I was just laughing because Nick's version of intimacy is like, I never told anybody this, but I'm still using... I'm not, I'm Microsoft not using... Microsoft Excel. 2003. I'm not using Clavio on the back end for my email. People are like... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gasps on the call. <laughs> I guess my, my question is like with, with this setup that you describe, is that like a, a more social type of endeavor or is that a like a business endeavor? Like is this a mastermind group or yes. is this like yes. your friends? No, it's, like, it's a mastermind group. Like yeah. I didn't know one of the four, but like yeah, Armand kind of knew him. Another the guy knew him and I was like, all right, cool. As I long think as you're... That they, they can blend ultimately, but like the, the initial endeavor is like, for that type of thing, that's a business <clears throat> endeavor, right? It's holistic. No, I, I talk mostly about like an ex-girlfriend. Yeah. I use those times to be like, I'm so fucked. I can't get out I'm of picturing, this. I'm actually picturing this type of thing can can be like broken out of alfalfa. Um, that's what I'm excited. Community, right? Like, yes. I'm imagining like Below starts exactly. one of these things. That's what I'm saying. And like, uh, it sounds pretty fucking cool. Brian's yeah. already working on this, so if you're listening, Brian, I know you are. Um, pipe up. Now's the time. Launch, yeah. baby. Yeah, because mm. this, this cool. sounds oh, yeah. pretty... And I, I, like, I like but four. But you can do it informally, and, and, and yeah, four people's And we did um, like an annual retreat. Yes. You, you in should person, get together. Three nights. Yes. You know, you go through the gratitude, you go through the goal setting, and then you get everyone gets a hot seat. Like, okay, yes. you have these other three or four very capable people's attention. What's your problem? What's your opportunity? Like... We'll all focus on you, challenge you, and then you come away with like, and you do that for ever for it's four great, people. Great man, this whole generation like feels like nobody cares about what they're up to. Like just having a simple like check in with somebody, even if it's one on one. Like another, I don't know if this is a mongerism. You could probably throw it in there. It's like <laughs> just like just, an just old, randomly yeah, throwing something throw, out. I'm gonna throw it. I'm gonna throw it under my. I don't know if Charlie Bunger said yeah, this, but I'm just gonna throw it. Uh, it's like. <laughs> Keeping, it was probably just a rando on Twitter, but <laughs> keeping up with like old friends is something that like, I think I, at one point in my life I did really great. And then in other points in my life, I haven't done great. And I think that like, one of the great things about being a dude in particular, women don't have this. I wish they did. Maybe they do, but in general they don't is like keeping up with old friends for guys. It's kind of like, I've heard most guys say the same thing that they hit up an old friend and it's like, they picked up where they left off right? Could be five years. And it's just like, no matter how much you've changed and grown, it's easy. And so, but you don't want it to be five, 10 years. So like having a basic reminder to check in with your inner circle is a really good idea. And you don't have to have a complicated Excel sheet for this, but just make a list of like your 25 favorite people and set a reminder to check in with them like every quarter because that creates that feeling of accountability and 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 you have someone That's to lean alpha, on baby. when you need That's it. That's alpha. It doesn't have to be nerdy. Just like maintain the relationship to a basic degree. Don't let life get in the way to your tweet where like when that starts to dip, that's when I think you start to die. I've been on the other side of the check-in. I'm like, what? What? 
Are they, yeah. What are they calling me? <laughs> what do you me? want from me? Hold Why on. are they calling yeah. me? And then I pick up the phone. I'm like, yo, are you, what do I need is to buy you from okay? You? Are you okay? <laughs> and then we have like this like 30 minute hour long just, yeah, what's, what's well, going phone, on? Phone and then I, calls I feel amazing afterwards. Blasphemous apparently these days. By the way, I don't want to speak for all the women in the audience, but I'm pretty sure every <laughs> woman in the audience is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Of course I've met with old friends. You're right. No, all that's seven of them are furious. Saying. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. You, oh. Wait. You just dad so you finger just double CNN to me. Finger wagged you. <laughs> Women. Tell me. Tell me what. what you, tell I me what you. Is that what did guy, you mean? The relationship that men have with other men is like it's just easier. It's easier, and you tend to pick up where you just left off. They tend to uh, have like an ease of relationship that is less complicated. That's it. Like it's that simple. So don't don't take right, it. Ladies, more than that ladies is. in the chat. I of suspect, course I'm gonna, I suspect of, are most you of you have felt the same. Trying to fry me? Situation. Can we uh, can we mention some uh, suggestions in the chat? So uh, yeah. Adam's got uh, weekly virtual Dungeons and Dragons. A great way to keep up with friends. Don't knock it till you try it. Um, oh, I Dan forgot Adam played D and D. And Tom and Mom play. says it, I would play that. I feel like that's I why I play, people I would. play golf. And I will say all those things are really great. But it, it tends. To, I don't know. In my experience. Those tend to be cursory. Like they're they're great ways to to keep in touch and go things, but but it, what you it, guys were talking about is intentional. Here are six p.m. on Tuesdays, and here's we're gonna, and here's our prompts. Like this is my and they're pretty heavy. This is my n- problem. We're like, like lightweight. Let's just remind ourselves and everybody that this podcast started because every Wednesday we met up at six seven o'clock at. Because Armand made us. He called it men's <laughs> night. He branded it properly. I established yeah. a quorum. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a requirement. And we and we said, oh, there was another thing about this. Like, as life... <laughs> I, can't, I can't see that. But see as it. life gets crazier, this is something that if you really care about <laughs> and you believe that what we're talking about is important, has to be a non-negotiable. What does that mean? That mm. means that, like... If it requires a, a renegotiation with your friends about like what needs to happen, you have to renegotiate that, but you have to hold it. And that means that other things that happen, you you can't just say, I'm sorry to say, okay, you have two choices when you have the baby. You either have the baby, <laughs> you either have the baby and you're gone, and that's it. Or you have the non-negotiable and you explain to your significant other that like, I need this night. Yeah, and but, and you and only you, you only it. you only get probably one of, of those cards basically. You get one. Brian and Johnson, expl- uh, the old Brain Tree founder, calls sleep his lighthouse, and I I like that like visualization. If you're a boat, you have to move around the lighthouse. You, there's no there's no accepting it. Like it, it is this immovable object that you move around if it if it needs to happen, and it seems like. Uh, Jordan's uh, limelighting as a as a listener. He says, as the old adage goes, men will start a podcast before going to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I love an intern is on fire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I prefer both. <laughs> I mean, if we cared about more about growth, we would probably do other things. But instead, yeah, maybe this is our, <laughs> our weekly therapy. And we have you friends to, to join us. By the way, Adam dropped another bomb in the chat. You know yeah. who just died? Who? No. Henry right. Kissinger. Oh, wait, oh, wow. just 100. Just like, now? Just, Today? I, the, wow. Five minutes ago, Washington Post. Wow. Damn. He was Damn. 100? 100. Who was a, he was secretary for which president? I don't know, like uh, all of them. I a feel lot like. of them. A lot of them? A lot of them. He's kind of one of those uh, power shaped, players who was probably like in the, ear. the modern world in a way that like virtually no human can claim to do. It's, it, it's kind of wild to, to think about it. And he did it, you know, mostly semi behind the scenes not as like uh, people knew who he was but like to think about what that man did like is is kind of nuts like the the influence you could have on billions of people yeah it's kind of wild yeah damn oh it makes you think man do you do you worry about like, do you ever think like why why am I here? Like what are what am I gonna be remembered Wait, by? Does it matter? Oh god. No, like, I mean I mean <laughs> those Steven. guys have epic obituaries. Steven. And I'm like, like I was thinking about Charlie Did you Munger. Just ask I'm like the why are we here question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't Steven be doing that Cesaro, 90 minutes in. Survived by three podcasters, bottom oh tick blur, god. top tick coin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, just like, playing with you, but no, like, like when are you Charlie worried about died, that? My brain was like, what have you done? 
No, I definitely uh, deserve it. And Nick, I was like, nothing, I really nothing appreciate brain, that nothing. Obituary. I was like, honestly, he would be more proud of that than anything else. <laughs> He'd He's be like, like, fuck yeah, I bought him Tickler. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't think it matters at all what we've done. I don't think it matters at all. Well, that, like, I, I had a friend text me. He's like, Charlie, unbelievable, greatest, love Charlie. And he's like, and nobody will remember him in 50 years. And nobody like, will. No, four it's generations. Not about I was like, oh shit. That, 50 that, that, years? Like, Come on. It does, but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it takes a certain number of generations and then no one will remember him, right? Eventually, it's just You dust. die two times. We'll the first time you die Beethoven. and then the last time someone mentions Why your name. Your name. Is that from... Uh, um, I don't know the source. No, it's, it, it is from a cartoon. Coco, thank you, Jordan. Wait, what? Yeah. But do you guys actually care about that statement at all? Like, because I I don't actually no, care. Not anymore. I I care to the extent is no. like, did I maximize my potential? And not only that, but did I choose the right things to care about? I like that. I mean, I, I like that framework that I maximize my potential as your version of success. But I think maximizing your potential has nothing to do with people remembering your name. Right. Like, yeah. Who cares about that? Like back to Steven, it's like, do we care about like caring about how people see you is not nearly as important as caring about how you see yourself and did you personally live a full life? Is that like and the maximize regret your minimization Absolutely. framework? Yeah, that's the regret is a huge part of it. But like there's so many people that don't give a shit about like their name and how people like saw their work and their accomplishments. I don't think accomplishments have anything to do with it. I mean, this is like Marcus Aurelius dedicated 50% of his work to this question, right? It, it, not his work, his his writing, his journaling, to this question of like, you could be, he had, he had like multiple chapters of his journal where all he did was like for his time, he listed all the great names of people that came before him and they were his heroes. And he was like, most people don't even know who the fuck they are. Like, I barely know who they are. They're gone. They're nothing. And like, it has nothing to do with like all the things that those people sought to do was to be the most accomplished, to be the smartest, to be the greatest philosopher, to be the greatest warrior, to be the greatest conqueror. It means nothing. It means nothing if, if it doesn't do something for so, you personally. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about this. Like my, my thesis is that the middle curve, and I'm talking about the middle 99%, the best thing you could do, you're, you're not going to be... The, the middle 99%? Yes, yes. So imagine the curve, and you got 0. 0.5 on <laughs> one not, on the I'm left really curve. I'm not seeing a curve. I'm seeing a straight line. Uh, I know. He's a, it's a Gaussian... <laughs> what is that? Two standard deviations? Yeah. Maybe three. Three standard I think yeah. that's like five. All right. Well, Four. thanks for geeking out on this. Let me continue. <laughs> I might have even forgotten what I was going to talk about now. And I'm like, what well, is Nick, that? You have three to be standard careful deviations? with the way you deliver yeah, these. Sorry. You guys sorry. could just say yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You just throw it out in front of this me. This is a serious crowd, dude. All right, all right. It's like me dropping like a steak bone in front of my dog. Just yeah, be like, yeah. don't, don't eat it. <laughs> okay. But the but the majority of people, the best thing they can do in terms of legacy is just um, bear good children. Like like take care of your children. Like be a good parent for them, and that's your legacy. You know, the left curve 05 percent for all the ter- like abominable shit they did. And then the right curve for like, yeah, they maybe positively impacted millions or billions of people. Those might be remembered on. But like, let's be realistic. Are the four of us going to impact billions of people in hopefully not in the left curve, but like in the right curve that lets our name live on for more than four generations? Probably not. So then then what is if, if that's not it and you have this like innate desire to kind of like leave something behind, then what else is there than your, your children? Like, can you... Can you be a parent to like good people that live on past you? Do you live your legacy through your your children? And well, I don't know. That's all I could come up with. Like all of civilization and everything that we've ever created is arguably um, a response to mortality. And the denial of death explores like all these different paths, um, which is by Ernest Becker. And like one of those is like just achieving your greatest potential and creating these like immortality projects, which are whatever you determine is your biggest footprint that you can leave on earth. That's your work. That's creative. That's unique to you. Other people would say it's just like falling in love and having like a great love life. And you can lose yourself in that and that romance. And it's very Shakespearean. Other people would say it's children. 
there and and Ernest Becker ends the book by basically mind fucking you and just being like I don't really have an answer I'm because sorry. Oh, because you I would know. agree <laughs> you, I know but because you, you guys would agree it's that it, that it like the purpose is entirely subjective right like your purpose yes. is yours well yeah because life is meaningless so that you get to fill in the blank yeah yeah it is autonomous you right. can choose the meaning um old charlie there said uh there's no greater purpose in life than um teaching like giving giving your knowledge to others that's his that's his uh purpose i don't even think he did a fucking phenomenal job of that because he like went on one podcast like he could have nah, done more. I mean, he did his public shareholder meetings in a very public format. And who knows? Maybe he just passed it he's on got to a his lot children. Of video. He's cool. He's, yeah, okay. He's doing better so, than Thomas. So he like he succeeded in that, but like I think there was room. I mean, he had these insane the things where like, mm. you know, this guy like delayed, like deferred gratification in his own life. Like this guy was a billionaire and he never bought things that were greater than like he never has a couple million never dollars did, he never did shit that like we've done many times yeah yeah <laughs> and he and in one of his last nice. interviews he got asked like hey um that's just you know why why did you defer gratification so much he goes well i wanted to pass that behavior on to my children like i wanted to show was them teachable moment that you can defer mm -hmm. gratification and be happy doing it and he wanted to do that, and maybe that's the reason he didn't buy a second bigger house and a third and a fourth and a fifth. I mean, that's pretty badass in its own right if that's what his aim was. But yeah, if that. But was, I think that's indicative of that. Like <clears throat> everybody's aim is their own. It's like it's entirely subjective. Is that subjective? I feel like we think like collectively that teaching kids delayed gratification is like the best thing. And and I feel like even if you don't say that, like if you, I feel like if you had a kid, you would instinctively be like, well, don't just immediately indulge yourself on everything you want to indulge. No, I, I I think you're right, but that's why Nick brings up the book Die with Zero. It's because it's it's such a it's such an instinctive thing for us to teach, where it's like, but there's nuance within that. Yeah, this guy probably you know died with at least over a billion dollars in account. He said the best way to armor against old age is a life well spent before old age before comes. Old age, yeah. Mm. And but at the same time he deferred all this gratification maybe to, to, to our sacrifice knowledge. To, yeah, our knowledge. to our knowledge and, and maybe he did it with a purpose of like I wanted to pass this behavior on to my children. But you know, he had all these sayings about, you know, living you know a what's full gnarly life. though, it's like he's not a social media guy. You know, like we don't know what the fuck he did, you know? So like maybe he lived his life to the fullest extent that he desired and and it was way beyond our recognition and like maybe he lived a fucking epic life right. that like we just never saw because he <clears throat> was never on social. T towards the die with zero thing as we kind of get closer to wrapping up, you know, they asked him uh, this was like 3 or 4 weeks ago, do you have anything on your bucket list? Mm -hmm. And he was like, "Oh shit, that's an interesting question." He goes, "Well, I'm so old and so close to dying that I can't uh, put catching the 200-pound tuna on my bucket list. Mm. And take that like in any direction you want. I think his point to the book Die With Zero is like, at certain ages, you can do certain things. And right. as you get older, you may not be able to There's catch a that 200-pound yeah. tuna. And he's like, I would like to do that, but like, I can't do that at my old age. So... I think the reprioritization of like what can you do in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s that you can't do in your the proverbial catch the tuna. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, mm. that's more important than maybe the writing the the obituary is mm. like what are the things that you want that you cannot do five, ten, fifteen years from now? I started doing this exercise, and it's kind of like a bucket list, but it's different. It's my exit list. Ooh. So it's like all the things I want to experience and buy. Okay. I'm like semi-materialistic, but not really. Like I like stuff that gives me a high, like I want like a fucking, you know, amazing man cave with like an amazing sound system. I would like to join the record man cave. player and like, not the record player. I could, wait, I wait, wait how's it different you know from I mean? a bucket list? Because um, it's like all the things, they, they require substantial amounts of money. Like 
a huge exit. So it's like if you exit, it's my for, like uh, when I when I exit. Oh, I thought you meant like when I exit this life. I was like oh, when no. you kick the bu- sorry, wait, wait, but because <laughs> I didn't have a bucket list really, okay. and I started making this exit list. And when I made the exit list, I realized oh, this is actually a, a really cool bucket list. And like actually, a lot of this stuff doesn't need an exit, like because a lot of it is experiences. Yeah. And I could have like variations of these experiences that don't need like, it doesn't need to be a, you know, $100,000 trip to Antarctica. It can be another you, version. You of can that. wolf it. You can third door it. Yeah, still. yeah you can yeah. wolf it. You can wolf it. Yeah. Um, can I give a quote? Please. And we, you can finish up, but I felt like it was very poignant. This is my top five favorite quote of all time. As a well spent day brings happy sleep, so a well. So a life well spent brings happy death. Leonardo da Vinci. But how, sir? Who the fuck is that? How? He doesn't he doesn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I what 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 I hear when I hear that quote is if you take Wait, the on. day Can you just read it one more time? Yeah, sure, I, I thought sure. it was pretty profound. Like, look <laughs> As a well spent day brings happy sleep, so a life well spent brings happy death. Yeah. I think about this more often than I don't even know. Like most people would ever think about such a thing. And that's why it's one of my top five favorite quotes. And what I think about every day when I wake up is how do I leave it all out on the court? And oftentimes I treat life like a little bit competitively, like a sport. And I always think to myself, like when I get to my deathbed, the main thing that I'm optimizing for is that I maximized my potential, to your point, and that I know deep, deep down, I actually gave my absolute best and I worked hard. Like for me, I don't enjoy, I've talked about this on the pod before, I don't enjoy rewards without hard work. It's just not my nature. I love to work hard and then drink the really fancy shit. Like that feels good and tastes better to me. So what I hear in Leonardo's quote is like, a day well spent means you maximized it. You worked really hard. You gave it your all. And if you do that repeatedly for the rest of your life, you can have a happy death. My my like recurring question ends up being, let's say you are like Charlie. You got an internal locus control. You are the protagonist in your life. You've created some flexibility in your life. You got a little arm on in you where you're like, I'm not going to follow the, or Robert Frost. You're going to go less, you know, beaten path. Okay, so you're in this position. So what is a well-lived life? You got to describe it. Like it's it's hard for me, right? Because um, it, to... it because it's not just effort based at that point. It has to be sort mm. of outcome based because like you've already achieved a level where it's like I I'm here now. Yes, right? I'm here now. I'm I here have these now. Resources. I have these skills I built over time. So I do feel like the protagonist. I can kind of bend the world 1% towards my favor, you know? And so what do I, what do I choose? What do I bend? Yeah. yeah. Mm. What do I want to bend? And uh, That's interesting. I don't, I don't know what it is yet. I maybe the obituary I, I, it's exercise. It's interesting that you see that. I didn't see that. I thought, I, I think maybe, maybe there is some bending to be done and maybe <clears throat> there is more, you know, of that. But like, I think effort is the key. Because, like, that's very, like, future thinking as well. Like, if as, as long as you do the thing that you're supposed to do that day to the best of your ability with the information that you have, you gonna, you're going to sleep well. Yeah, like... You're going to sleep well. I, and to me, that is the idea of that's progress, it. which I mentioned earlier. Like, yeah, exactly. well, I made progress exactly. today. I got a little healthier today. I... The, act, the active business... My relationship got... I made progress in relationship. And these are... I'm going down in my head, my goal <laughs> sheet... Like the active businesses did well, like the investments I I got, you know, made progress there. Or maybe I failed in some, but I made progress in others. Like, but in terms of what do I choose going forward, those have been my categories to this point. Is it just remain those same categories and I just try to Mm -hmm. progress in each of those throughout my entire life? No, I think for all of us, it's because we haven't gotten to that level yet where it's like we no longer, we're not post economics yet right but i think when you get there everybody's compass is different so like uh i imagine that uh, charlie's was like just want to get wiser every day 
and that will probably be ours as well. But like, there will also be other agendas too mm. that we want to enact. You know, mm-hmm. like that are beyond just economics. Like right now, we're all talking about economics. Right. Mm-hmm. I get that. So we'll we'll tackle it when it comes. <laughs> A couple of year, maybe a year or two. Hmm. Just one bull run. Steven just yeah. needs one more micro pump. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please, Ethereum, do anything. <laughs> anything. Please. Uh, God. Every day I wake up and Ethereum's down 0.2% while Solana's up 3%, I die a little inside. <laughs> you were supposed to tell us to shift more to Solana. What's going on? No, Armon was the savant on that one. Armon was. was Armon was saying buy I, Solana and Steven walked him out yeah, of the you, room. Yeah, you you almost I bought me. Solana at like $12. You booted but me. But sold it at $22. Go damn on. Damn right I did. <laughs> a hell of a gain. Hell of a gain. Yeah, I was uh, shamed for that move. <laughs> uh, Steven told me to get out of the room when I was like I want to buy Chainlink at $5. Oh <laughs> get no. Out of the room. Really? Yeah, you guys, you guys are ridiculous. I have been a <laughs> Solana just, bull let us forever. Just let us shame you for a minute. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. you let us shame right. me. <laughs> You're fine. You're mostly right. The receipts ex- I mean, do exist. Really. People who listen to this podcast are feasting off of my. It's on YouTube. <laughs> feasting. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Feasting. You got receipts. You got receipts. Uh, the people know. The yeah, people know. Hey, coin. The people. That's all you got to say. People's just say champion. coin. Just say coin. Coin. <coughs> coin. Coin. Uh, Coin, coin, coin. Oh, I'm glad we like well, completely podcast, digressed this very oh, deep. You said something about money. money. Sorry. You said something about money. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Well, I might not, even say uh, that podcast was a riot. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh my God. Another one of his receipts. Jesus. Dude, this All is right. my call, first of all. <laughs> I said Bitcoin miners. Absolutely not. All right. Oh, boy. Let's wrap what? it up there, boys. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next month or something. I don't know. Whatever. That was fun. I enjoyed that. That's I, good. I let's uh, let's find a place, a bar to go to and continue. Okay. Yeah. I like it. And we'll continue in the Discord as well. If you're not part of it, uh, go to alfalfapod.com. Join. Hop in the discussion. A lot, uh, a lot of peers there, a lot of mastermind peers, a lot of Charlie yeah. Mungers in there. Maybe some mastermind friends in there. I will be re-engaging next week. Oh, yeah. We get Armand back, fully back, in like two oh, weeks. I can't wait for that. Yeah. Can't wait for that. And then come back and just bulldoze Demo that days Discord. coming no, up. I'm tired of, I'm uh, gonna demo the Discord. tired of texting you what everybody tells you in the Discord. Be like, hey, Eric, <laughs> text Armand. I'm literally just going to come in so hot. All right. It's going to be great. Good night, fam. Thanks for joining us. We love Peace. you lots. See you next week. Later, guys.